He wins today would become the first National League pitcher to ever win six World Series games. Gibson has won five World Series games in a row, two in 64 and three last year. So he's shooting for several records today. Bob Gibson was so dominant in 1968 that it was hard to imagine he lost nine games that season. And he did it in an America rocked by death, turmoil, and protest seemingly every day. If there was a season to be angry, this was it. Senior producer Andy Moeller looks back in tonight's Spotlight Story. The eyes. They say the eyes are a window to a man's soul. And oh, what the soul of Bob Gibson contained. But first, the glare from those eyes. Menacing to a hitter, though Gibson said it was only the squint of a nearsighted pitcher trying to see his catcher's signs. That look sure scared Hall of Famer Willie Mays when he found out Gibson wore glasses off the field. Cameron Henry Aaron warned a young Dusty Baker not to do anything that would give Gibby a reason to knock him down with a fastball. It wasn't that he wanted to win. He never wanted to lose. That's, and, and there's a difference there. He refused to lose. Gibby just never, ever gave less than 110% every pitch. And that was just my personality, uh, you know, and people would look at me and think that I was unhappy about something or I was mad at something. And I really don't think that's the way I was, except when I pitched, I, I didn't really care what people thought about me. But back to the eyes, what those eyes did see and what pain the soul of Bob Gibson felt. Dr. Gerald Early is a professor at Washington University, a noted speaker and writer, and a lifelong baseball fan. And the thing about Gibson that I think was so impressive uh, to me as a, as, a young, as a teenage black kid was um, his indomitable will. He, he gave this impression of just having incredible will. And um, that really impressed me a lot that he was on the mound and he, uh, he thought that, you know, through his skill, he could just will himself to, to win. Gibson nearly died early in life. It didn't get much better in the years after. In his own words, he said, quote, I was fatherless, I was poor, I was black, end quote. Thanks to an older brother who became a father figure, Bob found sports and ultimately manifested his intense drive. And yet, his road to success remained bumpy. He was denied a basketball scholarship to Indiana due to their quota policy. He made it to the majors at age 23, but did not develop because of an outwardly racist manager, Solly Hemus. His guardian angel appeared in the form of Johnny Keane, who took over for Hemus in 1961. He wanted you to play strictly on the merits of whether you had ability or not, and it had nothing to do with anything else. I'm, I couldn't say the same thing for Solly. Three years later, Gibson had become an ace and a World Series MVP. Everybody in New York and all through the country uh, is just delighted the way you fellas perform. That and appearing on national TV did not help the conquering hero when it came to trying to buy a house in a predominantly white neighborhood. Gibson fought back, both forcefully and more subtly. This photograph, taken with teammate and funny guy Bob Euchre, caused the Cardinals to do a retake of their championship team photo. I was young then. I was still growing up myself, and uh, and I was I was involved with me more so than us. But you know, as you get a little bit older and you get a bit a little bit smarter, and you understand that it, it takes a team and it takes two or three different people to make a thing go. Several people who written about the Cardinals in the '60s have talked about the special kind of uh, camaraderie they had. Um, that was kind of going counter to the times because as the '60s went along. Racial division became more intense, actually. The Cardinals were the defending champions heading into 1968. Meanwhile, the eyes of Gibson watched as the world around him was literally on fire. At home, there continued to be racial unrest and rioting in cities like Detroit. While abroad, the war in Vietnam raged on, though growing more and more unwanted back in the U.S. It was a tremendously un unsettled time, and the war had a lot to do with it. 
the war was probably number one and race was probably a very close number two. Well, I don't know what will happen now. In April, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis. Gibson was distraught, along with many of his teammates. Baseball responded by delaying the start of the season. The Cardinals were presented as having a certain kind of special culture where the black and white players got along well. They were more supportive than probably on other teams. We have to uh, understand that in this country that there has to be equal opportunity. Then, two months later, Robert F. Kennedy was gunned down in Los Angeles. His presidential campaign was gaining steam with his stance favoring social reform and in ending U.S. involvement in Southeast Asia. Years later, Gibson wrote of he and his cardinal teammates at that time, we were angrier than usual, and I think it showed. The numbers bear that out. Beginning on June 2nd, Gibson won 15 of his next 16 starts, 10 of them by shutout. His ERA dropped from a stingy 1.52 to a microscopic 1. But yet black people were affected by the assassination of both of those men. And um, I think that the assassination of Kennedy even, you know, further intensified the growing militancy and unhappiness with black people. It can't help but affect you. I was in high school. I wouldn't say I was a specially political person or something, but it was affecting everybody. The Cardinals as a team took off as well, expanding their lead from a half game to 12. They won the pennant by nine, while Gibson's ERA established a new record for the live ball era, 1.12. When I wanted to throw a ball low and away, I could throw it low and away, and I would miss maybe that far. The turmoil of the times continued. The Democratic National Convention in Chicago was marked by violent confrontations between protesters and police. And in the same month as the Cardinals met Detroit in the World Series, Americans Tommy Smith and John Carlos staged their dramatic protest at the Olympic Games. Many people who lived through this period probably thought um, that if the America was going to fall to some kind of version of the French Revolution, <laughs> this was going to be it. <laughs> Look at that concentration on his face. Gibson continued his mastery on the mound on national TV, striking out a record 17 Tigers on a Wednesday in St. Louis. But the Tigers would win the series, taking game seven on that same field at Bush Stadium. Fans left the ballpark that day, not knowing the changes to the game that were to come. Pitching dominance by Gibson and others led to the mound being lowered by five inches. Four new teams would be added, the Cardinals team that had won back-to-back -back pennants would gradually be dismantled. Bob Gibson continued to pitch until 1975. He lived long enough to visualize the mark he made in that summer of 68. While you're having the career, you're not aware of it. And then one day you're sitting down and you're reading things in a book. Now that is amazing. I, I was just proud of what I did.